This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. For this episode of TWIV, I'm going back to December 2019, when I visited the National Center for Infectious Diseases, the main hub for both clinical treatment of infectious diseases and outbreak management in Singapore. In addition to a 330-bed clinical facility, the center is the home of the National Public Health and Epidemiology Unit, the National Public Health Laboratory, the Infectious Disease Research and Training Office, the Antimicrobial Resistance Coordinating Office, and the National Public Health Programs for HIV and Tuberculosis. In this episode, I spoke with the Executive Director of the National Center for Infectious Diseases, Dr. Leo Yi Sin, and Dr. Nancy T of the National Public Health Laboratory. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, a special episode recorded on December 12th, 2019. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Today we are recording at the National Center for Infectious Diseases in Singapore. And my guest is a senior consultant in the National Public Health Laboratory, Dr. Nancy T. Welcome to TWIV. Yeah, thank you very much. So we are in the National Center for Infectious Diseases, Yes, right? that's right. So the National Public Health Laboratory is part of that. Is part of that, correct. All right. And so um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, what you do here. As far as I know, this is a pretty recent laboratory, 2009. Yeah. Right. So. Why was this established, the National Public Health Laboratory? Yeah, because I think every country needs a national public health laboratory, Mm -hmm. uh, mainly in the performance of, uh, you know, activities such as surveillance of uh, diseases of public health importance. Um, Surveillance includes things like uh, influenza surveillance, for instance, you know, so we characterize uh, influenza samples from uh, sentinel sites and uh, send that to you know the global uh, influenza center, you know, right. so that they can right. inform vaccine, uh, you know, composition. Okay. You know, so we are part of that. So that's just one of the examples. Measles, rubella is another one. Enteroviruses, Salmonella. Mm-hmm. You know, these are uh, public health pathogens. You know that uh, each country needs to be uh, aware of and monitor. Yeah. So you have laboratories that. Mm-hmm bring in samples, clinical specimens, yeah. <clears throat> and then you have standard assays that you use. Yes. PCR, serology. PCRs, virus isolation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Virus isolation, I like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, I, I think in diagnostic laboratories, a lot of us are not using virus isolation no. anymore. No. Yeah. But for us, it's important to isolate them, you yeah. know, uh, so that you can further characterize them, you know, and we need live viruses, for instance, yeah. you know, for the uh, determination of like antigenic drifts, you know, sure. uh, for influenza viruses. So those one of the things we do. Um, we do that for measles as well. Mm-hmm. Mm. So uh, I'm at Columbia University and our hospital clinical laboratory doesn't do is- virus isolation. We just do PCR mostly mm, because okay. uh, they just want to see what's there. Yeah. So I think it's good to have the virus because... Yes. If someone, if a, if a scientist somewhere else requested it, you would provide it to them, yeah. right? And they could work with it. Yes, definitely. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> so these these assays are standardized, right? So yeah. they are reproducible across other places, other laboratories as well, right? Yeah. So we follow the usual protocols for cultures, mm-hmm. and, you know, the cell lines, recommended cell lines as well. Right. Um, the thing about the National Public Health Lab is that uh, we are not primarily uh, diagnostic unlike, you know, the usual diagnostic medical laboratories. Right. Yeah, so our main purpose is to do surveillance. Okay. Yeah. So there's an, there are other laboratories for diagnosis, yes. right? Yes, yes. So a physician would not send you samples for uh, diagnosis, yes. right? But Generally you. Not. So you want to do surveillance. So how would that work as patients come in with illnesses? You would request samples from them or they're automatically provided to you? Yeah, so we are a part of the Ministry of Health, you know, where surveillance mm-hmm. include, uh, you can, we have syndromic surveillance and we mm-hmm. have virological surveillance as well. So taking the example of influenza, then we have what we call sentinel sites, 
where uh, you know the doctors, if they see patients with influenza-like symptoms, then they will sample. Right. Okay, and they will send it to the National Pu Public Health Lab. That's where we take these samples. And these are from influenza-like illness. Then we look for influenza. We also look for other respiratory viruses as well. Because interestingly, uh, I mean, you know, we are a tropical country. Mm -hmm. We do not have uh, very, you know, uh, significant influenza seasons like northern hemispheres and southern hemisphere temperate countries. So we have two gentle peaks that correspond to the northern and southern <laughs> hemisphere. But year round, we still get influenza viruses. You know, year round. Yeah. So yeah. if you look at our pattern, it's just like that. Instead of one big peak yeah. in winter okay. and all yeah. that, because we don't have winter and stuff like that. Yeah. So you will get samples from throughout the country, basically. Yes. So Not we have just samples here. Sites. No. Okay, but you it will include here, but also many other sites as well. Yeah, we have GP clinics and we have so-called polyclinics. Got it. Yeah. All right. Now, before we go on and talk about more, um, mm. more specifically, I want to learn about your training. Mm. To bring you here, where are you from originally? Um, okay, um, I my country or where okay. you grow up? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm Singaporean now. Okay, yeah, but I grew up in Malaysia. Okay, yeah, and I studied here. Um, you went to college here. Yeah, university? I went to college here. Went to university here. I graduated from the National University of uh, Singapore, NUS. Mm -hmm. um, Were you a science yeah. major? No, no, I did medicine. Medicine. So, yeah. Medicine. So here from high school, you go right to medical school, is that yes. right? Yes. So our medical school is an uh, undergraduate program. Okay. Yeah. So uh, Very young when you decide to yeah. be a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So uh, after that, subsequently, um, you know, I worked in the, uh, our public hospitals and then uh, I did my training in medical microbiology, mainly in Singapore General Hospital. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and uh, that's where I am. <laughs> and so now, so you were trained as an MD with uh, microbiology. Uh, as a postgraduate qualification. Right. Yes. And microbiology would include bacteria, fungi, viruses, yeah, that's right? right. Yeah. Parasites? Yes, yes. Everything. Yeah. Right. So how, how this, this laboratory was founded in 2009. Have you mm. been here since the beginning? Um, not exactly in the beginning. I, I came a bit later. Yeah, mm -hmm. So what were you doing done. before you uh, came here? Okay, I, um, even currently, um, my main work is as a medical microbiologist in the yeah. National University Hospital. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I've been there for the past two years. Prior to that, I was in a pediatrics and a, a women's and children's hospital, KK Hospital. KK. Which is just, yeah, yeah just we passed door. it on the way Yeah, here. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, okay. I was there for 17 years. Okay. Yeah. So um, doing microbiology, mm -hmm. you would receive um, results, laboratory yeah. results, and help interpret them yes, for treatment, exactly. right? Yes, exactly. So okay. um, part of the microbiology service um, in, in these hospitals, so I've, my main job is in a diagnostic lab, but I have a part-time uh, so-called uh, FTE, you know, in the public yeah, health yeah. laboratory. Yes. Oh, okay. Mm. And so now, even uh, now, you, you do microbiology yes. consultation, Exactly, right? at NUH. Yes. And, but also with the... And uh, the NPHL, you Correct. you uh, help direct, saying what what does this mean? You know, what does this, yeah, this surveillance exactly. mean, and so forth. Yeah. So the specimens come in, the results are made, the, the, the tests are run, mm. and then you look at the results and you try and yeah. sort out should yes. we do anything? Yes. Or, or we also participate in meetings with uh, the Ministry of Health. Okay. Uh, CD, uh, Ministry of Health CDD or Communicable Disease Division. Mm -hmm. um, that's where, because, because, you know, when you do surveillance, uh, it, there's the public health aspect, you know, where the public officers go and collect information. Right. As well as the lab part where you get samples and you get your so-called, uh, your, either your bacterial or your virological data. Know, like for example, Salmonella will be doing the serotyping, mm -hmm, molecular mm -hmm. serotyping, fudge typing, and so on. And uh, so, so if, mm. if, a, if a new if a new microbe came along, mm. you know, let's say Zika virus, yeah. right, which hadn't been here before, how would your lab decide what to do? Does it start with you, or the Ministry of Health decides at what level? Okay, so um, that's where National Public Health Lab comes in. Um, actually, I didn't go into the first part. In addition to surveillance, right. uh, we also aid in the investigation of outbreaks. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. So nationally, if we have outbreaks, etc., and uh, as part of epidemiological investigation, for example, you require strain typing, um, National Public Health Lab will be the ones doing it. In addition, the our third part uh, of you know our existence is mm-hmm. actually to help in the diagnosis of these rare but dangerous pathogens or exotic pathogens, where you know normal diagnostic labs mm-hmm. would not uh, be able to have. You know, yeah, that yeah, capability. Yeah. So, for example, we have an EM, electron microscope, and uh, that has actually helped us in uh, diagnosis of our first monkeypox case. Yeah. Right, right. I saw so, that. Yeah, mm-hmm. I saw that paper. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the, the, the third part is that we actually do perform diagnosis, but that's usually for, uh, you know, agents that, uh, you know, is rare, uncommon. So, uh, for example, we have the biofire with the biotrack panel, you know, stuff like that, that the normal diagnostic labs will not be, you know, keeping, you know, or maintaining. Yeah. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Our, our diagnostic labs do maintain biofire panels? Of uh, they do. For the normal, uh, for example, respiratory virus multiplexes right. or the GI, GI panel, GI, uh, yeah. correct. Yeah. With the biotrack panel and other more exotic panels are uh, maintained by the public health. I see. So these are exotic panels. Yeah. <laughs> for example, uh, you're looking at Lassa fever, you know, right. or the viral hemorrhagic fever panels, you know, that kind. Yeah. Hendra, Nipah, mm. um, Ebola. Yeah. Okay. Are they, so are they all in one Biofire panel, or they are there different ones? I, I think there are currently different panels okay. in, in existence now. Yeah, okay. exactly. So what ha- were you involved with the monkeypox case? Um, we were part of it, but I wasn't directly involved. Okay. Yes. So if a new, if a new virus appears, the, mm. who develops the, the assays? Is it done in your laboratory? Okay, uh, we do try to be, you know, the one of the earliest ones, you know, because we've, you know, we have the capability to, uh, you know, to... Consult, for example, right, right. Uh, if a new virus comes out, if there's additional information, for example, at CDC or wherever else available, we have points of contact with these laboratories and maybe we can quickly, for example, obtain primers, you right. know, and uh, try to obtain, this, for example, at least some sort of positive controls. You know? Sure, yeah. sure. So you start validating. You start validating, the say, in the beginning. Because you have to know, as mm. your lab is doing it, it might, is it working, right? Yeah. And, and presumably, this is a decision made by multiple people who would say we need to start looking at Zika. Yeah, exactly. right? We have the first case, it's around the world, so now we have to start looking for it more extensively. Mm. So you would validate the assay and then mm. start processing, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So th- since you're a relatively new uh, laboratory, you, di- mm. you, didn't, you weren't here when the Nipah outbreak occurred. Uh, Do you remember? (laughs) Yeah, that was some time ago, yeah. So the meeting I went to here, which is why I'm in Singapore, Ah, is the NEPA 20 Mm. uh, 20 years ago identified, Mm. right, in Malaysia and here in Singapore. So do you remember at all? (laughs) Yeah, I do. I do remember. You must have been... um, Yeah, more than 20 years ago, I wasn't a specialist yet. Were you in medical school still or...? Um, I think I've graduated. (laughs) Okay, so you're working. Yeah, Yeah, I was working, yes. Okay. Yeah. But since 2009, there have mm. been H1N1. Yeah. Mm. So, so influenza is interesting because, as what you said, you don't have these big spikes. Because mm. in the and this is very puzzling to me. So in in the northeastern U.S., influenza is seasonal. Yeah. Big spike in the winter, and then very little in yeah. the warm months, right? Correct. So I always teach that flu is a seasonal disease. Yes. And then they say, but why do the tropics <laughs> have it at all? Because yeah. it's best transmitted in, um, in cold conditions. Yeah. But it's a very, is it a very low level of, in fact, how many cases a year are we talking about? Um, okay, I don't have the chart with me. Yeah. How many no, cases? We're not talking about millions, right? Yeah. Tens, thousands, tens of thousands, probably. Uh, no, our population is about 5 million. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so it's five very million. low. No, so it's, it's not, we're not seeing the numbers that you see in the U.S. Because bear in mind, we're just a city state. Yeah. 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 Unfortunately, I don't have it off my head. It's okay. So, I mean... Mm. Um, I can tell you the number of severe cases because that's easier to remember. Okay? okay. So week by week, we have less than five, you know, like sometimes zero, sometimes two to three. Yeah. So uh, part of the su- influenza surveillance involve uh, not just ILI, you know, uh, we influenza like illness, yeah. Uh, not just influenza like illness, but we also look at severe, uh, you know, diseases due to influenza. So we monitor the numbers, and uh, Ministry of Health requires that 
the hospitals inform the ministry if they have a severe influenza case. Okay. So based on that and the transmission levels, then we determine like, you know, how you know, how high is the transmission, what is the risk, you know, and that kind of thing. So you have yeah. about five? Uh, we cases. have less than five or se- severe cases in a, in so-called, uh, a let, month? Me think, uh, let me think, uh, in a week. Okay, in throughout a, the year. Throughout, throughout the year. So we can have zero. Uh, certain times we have zero, some certain times two or three. So we are talking about single digit numbers yeah. uh, per week. But you you do surveillance mm. throughout the year, right? We do surveillance throughout the year. So we monitor yeah. numbers every week. And every week there's a meeting um, at the uh, Ministry of Health where mm-hmm. we look at the biological data, you know, and, you know, the alerts that are submitted by the hospitals, you know, and then we collate and yeah. look at trends. Yeah. Because I think trends. I think in the U.S. we don't even do surveillance in the summer for ah, influenza. Okay. I think it stops sometime in May. Ah, okay. And so we do we suspect that strains are still circulating mm. at a very low level, maybe comparable to what you see here. I just don't know. Oh, okay. And then surveillance doesn't begin again till the fall. Oh, I see. It's different. So you start you do it we all do year. It, yeah, we do it year round. Yeah. So does anyone who comes to a hospital with ILI they they would have a Nasal pharyngeal wash and or swab. Uh, so not all the time. So as I said, you know, we take our yeah. IRS samples from Sentinel sites. So they yeah, okay. these are Sentinel sites. Yeah, okay. correct. Yeah, of uh, polyclinics and GP clinics. So selected clinics. So again, if you are just talking about management, sometimes yeah. they may not be tested if the case is mild. You know. Okay. Yeah. And so, um, how do you, how are you analyzing these by PCR mainly? Yes. Okay. So, um, fortunately, we have enough resources. So, we've done actually quite a lot for our ILI specimens. We actually subject the whole lot to uh, multiplex PCR. Mm-hmm. So, we are able to uh, determine, for example, the circulation of uh, the various uh, viruses, respiratory viruses, in addition to influenza um, viruses, mm-hmm. and. Uh, so we make sure that, um, okay, we subtype all the influenza A viruses and, uh, we also subject a subset of these, these, you know, part of the surveillance to culture and to whole genome sequencing. Mm. Yes. So with that, then, you know, you can de- so-called determine the various subclades in your, for example, your H3, mm. uh, your H3 subclades, your H1 subclades and so on. And uh, we share that with our WHO Collaborating Center. Um, yeah, so this is part of the work that we do. There's a WHO Center here, right? Uh, no, we we send our we we send our isolates mostly to Melbourne. Melbourne, okay. Yeah, because we are part of the uh, Western Pacific group. Got it. Yeah. So you also get virus isolates, right? Yeah, because we culture and we send our virus and, isolates. And uh, well. those are valuable resources for mm. people. So those go to the WHO center and then they can provide it to other yes, people as they, well. Yes, they will do the yeah, hemagglutination inhibition and stuff. So like I did that. my PhD on influenza. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> Many years ago with Peter yeah. Palazzi. Okay. And so this, maybe um, later on you should meet one of our scientists because then she has those charts and all that that you sure, can see. Sure, sure. Virus great. distribution. I don't have it now, but... No, it's okay. Uh, now I work on enteroviruses. Oh, I see. I don't know. Do you do okay. surveillance for enteroviruses? Yes. Yes, we do that as well. Um, one of the things that we are doing is the hand, foot and mouth disease. Right. And, uh, so we have samples again from, you know, certain sentinel sites and we will usually try to, uh, look for, for example, uh, what are the circulating enteroviruses causing hand, foot and mouth disease. Cause in the past years, I think, um, maybe in 2005, we had mm-hmm. a severe, uh, so-called outbreak of enterovirus 71. 71. Yeah. yeah. And 71 yeah, yeah. seems to be a problem. For example, in Taiwan, Southeast sure. Asia seems to be an issue here. China also. Yeah. And China is especially, yeah. As in fact, well. they have a vaccine. Yes, they do. For yeah. EV 71. Yeah. So what is the current circulating uh, influenza virus H1N1? Okay, we have co-circulation. Mm-hmm. Okay, okay, H3 and H1, uh, influenza B, it always co-circulate. And, you know, people try to determine what's going to be predominant. I can tell it's very difficult. Yeah, of course. Of course. <laughs> this prediction is impossible. All right, so right now you have H1N1, which was the 2009 pandemic strain. Right? Yes. H3N2 yeah. and then 2B strains, I yeah, guess. Yeah, correct. Right? Co-circulating, yeah. yes. And so, I guess this country vaccinates against influenza, right? Yes. So we recommend uh, influenza vaccination, uh, especially for healthcare workers and frontline uh, healthcare workers. Uh, right. But it's very interesting because um, in Northern Hemisphere, <coughs> excuse me, you can recommend 
the you know the northern uh, hemisphere vaccine and you know if in Australia it's a southern you know yeah, so for yeah. us <laughs> uh, sometimes we 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 you know the two vaccines will come out you know uh, twice a year so so for us um, I I personally think that one vaccine a year will do because yeah. sometimes you know it, I think it's too much if you decide to yeah. But uh, it, it's, it's not easy. It's not easy in certain countries like uh, the tropics, as you realize that in some countries, they don't have certain peaks. And for us in the tropics, it's not very clear uh, whether we are northern, more northern or more southern. In some mm -hmm. countries, it may be a bit obvious, like more <coughs> northerly countries like uh, maybe Thailand, etc. They have determined that the circulating, the circulation, you know, of viruses is m more like the northern hemisphere yeah, yeah. Uh, but in some countries like for example Malaysia for instance uh, was difficult to determine you know because their circulation and their trends uh, doesn't seem to follow either northern or southern so uh, in terms of uh, recommending which uh, vaccine to use northern or southern it becomes quite difficult mm, right mm. so actually for us once the vaccine is available we just say for those who have not been vaccinated please go and get the latest vaccine so that in general is what is uh, our um, recommendation. Uh, yeah. And once a year is sufficient. But although you said there are, there are kind of two bumps yeah, throughout the year. Yeah, there are kind of two year. bumps, yeah. So someone was telling me yesterday that mm. some people feel that you should be vaccinated twice then. Right? Yeah, but, I think that's there's hard. No I think there's no consensus on that. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Sometimes the northern and southern vaccine composition is the same. In which yes. case you say, oh, okay, One no worries. One is enough, right. Okay, yeah. But if it's significantly different, then you may say, no, if you haven't had your jab <coughs> or if you had your jab some time ago, then, the, you know, yeah. yeah, just go and get the latest jab. Yeah. I guess uh, you followed the universal flu vaccine stories right mm, yeah. where one vaccine for your life might be yeah unfortunately we don't have it yet but yes. that would be helpful then right oh, definitely yeah <laughs> obviously definitely yes now we in the northern hemisphere we look to the southern hemisphere to see what strains because that's that's where they come from right so during our summer we have very low circulation and here it's well it's not winter but mm. <laughs> you know in countries like australia it would be winter yeah and whatever is circulating there will then come up and be our next seasonal strain. So we look to here to see what's to make in the vaccine. Mm. So sometimes the northern and southern hemisphere vaccines are different, and you yeah. said sometimes they're the same. Yeah, sometimes they're the same, yeah. But basically, there's a steady level of influenza here with a couple of very small bumps. Yeah, with bumps. I, yeah. I should show you the charts, you know. Yeah, yeah, we can yeah, take a yeah, look yeah. at it. Sure, take a sure. look at that. Yeah, just want to get an idea. Yes. So, yes. is that a big uh, part of your surveillance influenza, or mm. are there? Other, I guess dengue would be bigger, right? Uh, okay. So, of course, in in addition to influenza, measles, rubella, enteroviruses, uh, dengue Dengue's as well. Yeah. Chikungunya. Uh, yes, yes, the arboviruses. Right. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, uh, for example, we did detect a small Zika outbreak here. Uh, that's um, 2015. Yeah, 2015, 2016, I think. So yeah. just after the Brazilian mm -hmm. outbreak, yeah. Yeah. How did that get picked up initially? Uh, okay, I can't <laughs> really remember the story. Frankly, <laughs> I'm sure it was published somewhere. Someone told me yesterday. <laughs> yes. That there were patients with dengue-like illness. Yes. So rash and a joint pain, and they were negative. Negative. Yeah. So. They said, well, let's look for Zika. And, and there it was. That was yeah. possible. How many cases are we talking about? Not many, right? No, no not, not many. We had an outbreak that probably less than 30, I think, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Hmm. Mm. And um, there's obviously no microcephaly associated with this. It's too few. Right? Uh, yeah. So we had a, a few pregnant um, ladies who yes. were infected. And I think we monitored. But um, I think the outcomes were good uh, so far. I think some of them are currently still being monitored. They've so, delivered already. I've not heard of any adverse outcomes. So you are doing surveillance for Zika now, right? So you have mm. assays established in the laboratory. Yeah. PCRs and virus isolation. Mm, okay. Uh, yes, I think we did try to do that vi virus isolation, uh, but we don't have that many cases yeah. at all. Yeah. Uh, since that outbreak, um, maybe we had one or two cases after that. Some of them were imported. But we didn't have, uh, fortunately, sustained transmission. Yeah. Yeah. So sustained that was quite, transmission, right? Yeah. So that was uh, quite fortunate because we have the vectors. <laughs> Aedes aegypti, right? Yeah. yeah. Correct. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, it's a good question why you didn't have, because I, I assume that the population is mainly seronegative for Zika, right? Yeah, yeah. But it's very difficult to do serology in, in our country mm -hmm. because dengue is endemic. Yes. And uh, even if you want to do things like print, you know, um, yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's very difficult because uh, a certain proportion of our population have prior infection with dengue. Yeah, so, yeah, so, and so it's, it's not and, easy. And to it's integrate. not easy to differentiate between Zika yeah. with neutralization assays. Yeah, even with neutralization yeah. assay, because there are some people who say that, oh, okay, so if you do neutralization assays, you have to include dengue as well. You know, yeah, if yeah. you're looking for Zika, you also got to look, do neutralization tests to both dengue and Zika. And then perhaps uh, the higher titers may be the one that's responsible, for example, higher titers to Zika versus dengue if you do it in one person. Yeah, yeah. But then, um, I, I think there have been some uh, reports, you know, where it, it's not necessarily true. You know? mm -hmm. I understand yeah. that you can use um, NS1 mm. to differentiate Zika from dengue now, you, but it's a different assay. I don't know if you do different that. Assay. Okay, so in terms of diagnostic testing, there are commercial assays available. Uh, NS1, dengue NS1 is being used here locally quite mm -hmm. often mm -hmm. as part of our frontline diagnostics because you know it's a quick rapid test, lateral flow test, yes, yes. and it's quite sensitive. Yeah, yeah. So we do that for our suspect dengue. Yeah. Uh, in terms of Zika, we're still recommending the PCR test. Okay, uh, I don't think at the moment there's, there are very good <coughs> NS1 for Zika at the moment. So, uh, our current recommendation for suspect Zika cases is still PCR. Yep. So we can do it from blood, from the urine. The urine excretion of the virus may be a little bit longer. So we can do that for mm -hmm. cases that come to medical attention, say right. maybe after five days or so on. But I think within the first five days, viremia is probably detectable. Mm -hmm. So again, you're doing surveillance for Zika, right? So what, what samples would you procure to to do that from people with febrile rash illness, basically? So you do dengue and Zika at the same time? Okay, uh, so what happens uh, with the ABO viruses is that um, we do it together. Uh, there's a program that uh, we run together, you know, as part of a national program. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there is also, uh, you know, like monitoring the, uh, the mosquito burden, you know, and yes. also looking at, uh, you know, so-called carriage of viruses in this, you know, a sample of the mosquito population. Right. So that's one part. And uh, then samples uh, coming from the diagnostic laboratories uh, that uh. have been tested for uh, dengue or suspect Zika. So what happens is that we take these samples. So these are cases where, you know, they suspect arbovirus infection. Usually primarily for us is dengue. So for the dengue negative ones, we will test for Zika, chikungunya and see whether, you know, there are other things circulating, so that's part of what we do. So do you also look for Japanese encephalitis virus? No. No, no, we don't. Yeah. It's not a problem here? At the moment, no. At the moment, okay. no. And uh, we've got, we hardly got any agriculture at all. So... Uh, like farming? We, you don't have much farming? No. Very, very little, yeah. Definitely mm. no pig farms and, you know... No pig farms? No yeah. pig farms at all, Because yeah. back in 99, the NEPA came to a pig farm, so that's gone now. Right? Um, back in 99, that's quite interesting because the, <laughs> we were importing pigs from Malaysia. Right. Yeah. Uh, some of the pigs come over as live pigs and they were slaughtered Oh, in an abattoir, right. Ah, that's right. So, so they're not uh, actually raised here. They were not raised here. Uh, I think in the 50s... In the 50s, 1950s or so, um, Singapore had pig farms. We were very much like Malaysia, you know. Um, but I think as the country developed, then uh, I think a decision was made to phase out the pig farming. Yeah. Because uh, they used quite a lot of land and we were land scarce, you know. So that's one of yeah, the yeah. reasons. So so we phased that out. Yeah. So Very we large. have very, very little, no large scale farming of, uh, you know, like cattle, goats and stuff like that. There may be small farms, but you know, just niche kind of thing, but nothing hmm. big at all. Yeah. No, so pig, there are definitely no pigs. Pigs farming is environmentally bad, mm. right? Yeah. Generates lots of toxic uh, fumes and so forth. So it's in a confined space like this, it's probably a good idea. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And also they can be reservoirs for influenza viruses, yeah, as you know. Yeah, definitely, yeah. And, uh, and uh, as we saw back then, Nipah virus as well. Mm. Um, so I want to 
just finish up with influenza now. Mm. Do you remember the 2009 pandemic? Yeah. So that's when the laboratory had just started, right? Yeah. Uh, well, in a way, the uh, National Public Health Lab we began um, a little bit earlier. I think mm -hmm. it was in 2007, about two years 2007? ago. 2007. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so, how, do you remember how this uh, pandemic developed in this country? Because in the rest of the world, you know, it exploded. Yeah. Starting in Mexico, California. Yeah. yeah. Actually, it was first picked up in California. Yes. And then suddenly, all over the world, it was it was picked up. So, when did it happen here? Do you remember? Okay, uh, I remember we did have enough time. We did have enough time to uh, order primers oh, okay. and probes for our PCR assays and to validate them. Uh, so to, to do the minimal, at least the bare minimum validation. Mm. So we were quite fortunate. Uh, we do at Ministry of Health a lot of horizon scanning. So we were aware and we were looking very closely for the first case to come down to Singapore. You know, mm. And uh, so I, I did remember we did have a, a containment phase and a mitigation phase. Uh, you know, so in the beginning, we were looking very hard. Uh, you know, screening for, you know, uh, as in, you know, people are ill coming from these countries who are infected and so on. Sure. Uh, so we were fortunate in the sense that we had time. Uh, so mm. one of the things that we wanted to do nationally or we did nationally was to uh, equip our public health labs with, a capa with uh, molecular capability. You know, right. so the majority right. of our public health labs to have, uh, you know, PCR capability at least, you know, to detect uh, these viruses. So at that point in time, we were able to say, okay, at least uh, for a few public, uh, so-called public hospital laboratories to be ready mm. to have the primers and, and the probes or the at least the PCR assay for H1N1, pandemic H1N1 ready. And you could provide them with standards, right, to use, to yeah. validate their assays and yes. so forth. Yes, we, right. we did assist in that, yeah. So when it when the virus did arrive, you started to see cases, right? Yeah, we started to see cases, and and the labs, especially the diagnostic lab, had to do a lot of testing. You mm -hmm. know, they had to ramp up the testing because, uh, in the containment phase, we we had to test as many suspect as possible and try to contain it right. until it reached a certain uh, number where we say you know you have to do some mitigation and uh, you you can't isolate everybody and it's only those severe cases that get admitted into hospitals and so on. So uh, in the overall picture, was it a blip of H1N, pandemic H1N1? Yeah, yeah. so we did have a peak. A, a substantial yeah. peak. Yeah, we did have a substantial peak. Once it came into the country, it went up. <laughs> yeah, because there were a lot of susceptibles, right? Yes. yes. And then it went down, and then yeah. it just remained at a low level since, right? Uh, yeah, and then it became part of our seasonal virus. Yeah, yeah. of course. You know, seeing how many people come into the country all the time, it's not surprising that <laughs> virus exactly. quickly arrives, right? Yeah, the airport exactly. traffic is, you know, on the top 10 yeah. in the world. So yeah. for a small land area, that's a lot of people bringing viruses here. Yeah, exactly. exactly. So what you're doing is important. You know, you have to yeah. be looking to make yeah. sure nothing is going on. Yeah. So you also, so de dengue is another one we talked about. You do a lot mm. of dengue surveillance. Mm. And sometimes there are outbreaks, right? Uh, yeah, we we <laughs> we have been fortunate. Um, I think our last big one was it twenty fifteen. Uh, twenty fifteen, there was quite a lot of dengue, mm -hmm. but um, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. I think the numbers were lower. Yeah, um, and recently maybe a, a slight dip up again. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And someone told me yesterday it's mainly in older patients, not in kids. Okay. Interestingly. Um, our pattern is not like Philippines. We are quite different from Philippines. Philippines has a lot more pediatric, pediatric dengue. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't know. Maybe it's in terms of exposure. We do see dengue in kids, but not as, uh, the proportion is not as high as compared to some countries like Philippines. Right, right. Yeah. And again, this is 80s Aegypti vectored, right? Yeah. Um, is it also Albopictus vectored? Albopictus is, uh, if I'm not, it's, not so common because it's it's more like uh, associated with a lot of vegetation. Our Egypti, yeah, they can be everywhere. Egypti is house, household, yeah, household, yeah, yeah. So it's very prevalent, very here. peri domestic, right? Mm. But uh, albopictus are everywhere. <laughs> yeah, but I, I think the proportion is less. Okay, but I, I can't really. So do you re recall offhand how many dengue cases we're talking about a year in a in a non epidemic situation? Huh. Thousands. To check the website. Yeah, to check the website. Yeah, 
Uh, no, thousands would be in a bad year. In okay. A bad year. Okay. Yeah. Because bear in mind, we're just like five five million city state. Yeah. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, yeah. It's just small. <laughs> This year, this year, there are 10,000 cases, yeah? More than 10,000. 10, 10,000 already, is it? So this would be an outbreak then? Yes, yes. Higher. This year was higher, yeah. I suppose it's cyclical because you accumulate... Well, I don't know. If it's an, if it's an older population, I don't know why they would become seronegative. They're susceptible, right? Because mm -hmm. usually new children are born, then they're susceptible. When you get enough mm. of those, the virus goes in, you have an outbreak. But if it's an older population, I don't know what's going on. It's okay, strange. yeah, so various reasons has been postulated, but I think nobody really knows, you know. So yeah. one of the reasons they say, oh, okay, uh, new dengue strain, you yeah, know, sure, uh, sure. then okay, you get a higher number. But sometimes it doesn't really work out that way, you know. So yeah. you can see uh, in your surveillance, you can see when numbers start to go up for. Oh yeah, yeah. And then you. So if you see dengue numbers, isolation start to go up. What would you do? Who would you tell? Okay, so uh, Ministry of Health. Uh -huh. You know, uh, as I said, you know they do. Uh, they monitor these numbers, you okay. know, uh, on a weekly basis. So uh, they work together with the environment, uh, environmental health agency. So things that they will do would be, for example, they may send out, uh, for example, environmental health. They may send out officers to go to the homes, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, you know, to check the houses and to see whether they are breeding sites, you know, this one of things. And the other thing is that, uh, of course, there will be, uh, you know, messages sent to the public, for example, uh, using mosquito repellents and right. stuff okay. like that. Okay. So there will be so-called, you know, like public health messaging, you know, uh, in terms of, let's say, we anticipate numbers to go up. And uh, we, we've always had our ongoing dengue campaign, you know, about not leaving stagnant water and so on. So this may be intensified if you see that, you know, the numbers are really going up and not coming down. Mm. So this kind of public health messaging uh, and uh, advices, you know, so and sending out, pub, uh, sending out uh, officers to the neighbourhoods. You know, to, you know, go door to door, you know, we actually go door to door <laughs> to, you know, to examine, you know, whether the houses has uh, stagnant water, yes, to speak yes. to the residents, you right. know, to give advice, send out pamphlets. So these are some of the actions that we, we do. Yeah. yeah, to try and control the mosquito mm -mm. population, which would then control the outbreak. Yeah. <clears throat> and if, uh, there is a vaccine that's been approved here, but I guess you don't use it. That's what I understand, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> well, we've seen what happened in the Philippines. Um, yeah. I think one of the reasons we didn't um, put our recommendation, you know, like included in our mm -hmm. you know, national vaccination is because of the data, you know. The data hasn't been very um, promising. Yeah. And there's yeah. this issue of uh, <coughs> antibody enhanced, uh, you know, kind of thing if you... So, so we noticed that uh, if you haven't had a prior infection and you had a vaccine and then actually you have dengue, your dengue will be worse than if you didn't have it sure. because of antibody yeah, yeah, yeah. enhancement. Well, there are some new dengue vaccines coming through yeah. and maybe those will be okay. Maybe. So we still yeah, have to look at the data. At and, um, yeah. yeah, I it's, heard it's, there's one, uh, mm. uh, it's, the Takeda is, mm. is making a vaccine, which is in clinical trial, mm. which protects very nicely against type 2, but not the other <laughs> <laughs> yeah. serotypes. Yes. So someone I was talking to yesterday said he thinks we, they should give both vaccines, but he said the public health people don't want to do that. They don't want to use both. So. Yeah, I think it's very tough to make a decision yeah. and say two vaccines, you know. I think but, but he said um, yeah. it's very mild, the dengue you see here in this country. Uh, not necessarily. We do have dengue hemorrhagic Fever, disease. Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. And we have fatalities as well. This year have already up to 20 deaths cases. 20 deaths? 20 deaths? Yeah. Yeah. Among the total at the end of the November, the total dengue cases is about 50k. 15,000. 15, 15, uh, that's a lot, yeah. Through November. Wow, that's a lot. Oh, yeah, yeah. So that's about the highest it gets, right? <clears throat> That's the high year. The previous high year is 2013. Oh, okay. I thought In it was 15. That year is about 22,000. Okay. Ah. And so for these outbreaks, mm -hmm. you would have virus isolates you can provide researchers to work on, right? Yeah, yeah. To see if, if there's anything unusual going on. Yeah. So that's a very important part of what you do as well, besides just seeing what's circulating. Yes. Right? Yeah. Uh, I was looking on your website, and mm. chicken gunya, it says... 
you, is another virus you look for, right? Yes. Do you do surveillance for that? Yes, it's part of the other virus uh, surveillance as well that we are doing. Yeah, and uh, we we do get quite a bit of cases of chikungunya uh, imported, and sometimes we have sustained transmission for a short while. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But it is not as high. It is not like uh, our dengue, where we get such high numbers. But we do get it. Mm. Okay. Again, Aedes aegypti and Albo picked this for chick, right? So you know, there's a there was a new strain that emerged that could grow well in Albo pictus, uh, right? I don't know. Strain. The uh, majority of them are the previous strain. It's not the no, okay. A two two six E. Yeah, it's, it's the pre it's the one that does Aedes aegypti. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The okay. Outbreak, but mm. Okay. Not, yeah, majority are imported cases. But you're mm -hmm. surveillance. You're doing surveillance for chick as well. So <coughs> yeah, if patients have joint pain or yes, you would be looking at yeah that uh, our yeah. EHI and also our doctors uh, do, they will, they will request and chikungunya PCR is um, available as a routine diagnostic test in our major, our big, you know, public hospitals. So a physician can order it. They yeah. can order it, yes, okay. as a diagnostic test. Another one that you uh, list on your website is uh, MERS, coronavirus. Mm, yes. Yeah, Have you had a case here? Uh, no, not fortunately no. Not yeah. imported, not endogenous or octoxinous, I guess. No. no, but we are always on the lookout because um, we, we do have a significant Muslim population, yeah. you know, that go for the Hajj. So every year, you know, we are always looking out for it. And there's quite a bit of travel to the Middle East as well. That's so, how it would be here because you don't have camels, mm, right? Yeah, we don't. We don't, yeah. yeah. But uh, I think, of course, we are very, very concerned if there's any first case, you know. So... Um, the the essay because now there are also commercial essays available for MERS, um, so uh, a number of uh, our diagnostic labs already has the capability to test for it, and uh, National Public Health Lab does not need to be the front line for testing. So the doctors uh, are made aware that they should look for MERS in patients that fit the criteria. For example, having the right symptoms and travel history. So we're always on the lookout for that, yeah. So the thing with MERS is mm. if you do good infection control in the yes. hospital, you can contain it, right? Yes. So you need to know early on if it's MERS or yes. not, right? So Because yeah. if you don't know it's MERS and then yes. they're not doing the particular infection control, then it can spread yes, in the hospital, right? Exactly. Which we saw happened in Korea, right? Correct, correct, yeah. yeah. Okay, so that's why another reason why you have to have this diagnostic capability. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, we're going to say something? Oh, no, no. I was just saying that uh, I think all the hospitals are uh, informed, you know, to look out for all these uh, prevalent diseases. And if they have a suspect patient, they actually put them into isolation first. Then they send for the test. If it's negative, then the patient's de-isolated. De yeah. That's provided they recognize, you know, the patient has given the history. You know, you can have cracks. Lah. Yeah. But the Makes current, sense. Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. current protocol is that if you have a suspect patient, you isolate first. Then you do the lab test. And I think and we, we even order for two, at least two samples to be negative before the isolation. <laughs> yeah. I think travel history is a big part of that yes, too. Yes, exactly. So if someone's in the hospital with a respiratory illness, exactly. and they say, oh, I, I just came from Saudi Arabia. Yeah. Then boom, isolation. <laughs> yes, correct. <laughs> right. That's what we do. Yeah. Yes. So it's very important <laughs> that the uh, patient is able to say that, yeah, mm. the, give, give the correct travel history. Yeah. Because it's very difficult to verify, right? If patient denies it, then yeah, none of it. That's a problem. Yeah. yeah. Um, another one on the list was H seven N nine, which uh, circulates can circulate in China. In China, yeah. So then, again, that would be an imported case, mm. right? Yes. So you're you're screening for that. Yes, we do that. Yes. So the the ministry as well. Uh, whenever there is a H seven N nine circulation in China, there's we notice that uh, now there there are waves. So there are certain times where it is really very low numbers. Uh, then we so called decrease the alert, and uh, I think after June or something like that, then the numbers in China will go up. Then uh, we'll just remind the hospitals to look out for such patients, you know, with, with the correct symptoms and the travel history. And as I said, um, we mm. try to make sure, uh, our, uh, I mean, our current public health laboratories has molecular uh, testing capability and they are able to look for avian influenza. That's one of the things that they need to, to, to have the capability. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the doctors can request if they suspect avian influenza, they can request for testing. So the same thing goes if they suspect such patients you know, such, such suspect patients are, are there, they will be put into isolation. 
uh, specimens we sent for testing um, only the isolated if it's negative. Yeah. So again, this would be uh, travel. Yeah, it's again based on travel. Because yeah. these are typically acquired from birds, chickens in China, right? Live uh, poultry markets. Po poultry markets, which yeah. you don't have here. Yeah, so we don't have live <laughs> poultry markets at all. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I think, I mean, China is probably going towards like, uh, I, I think, no, live poultry market, uh, very difficult, right? Yeah, I guess. We have still some in the U.S., you know. No, I wasn't aware. In New York, once I was doing a podcast, so I searched in the New York area, you can find places live to buy poultry. chickens. Wow. Yeah, which yeah. I, I was very surprised. Um, <laughs> yeah, I was surprised. I'm surprised, <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> we have wild chickens. Wild chickens. In one, but they control it. They, they ah. determine the yeah. they control where they want to go. So they have to yeah. bigger. Yeah, right. Um, so have you ever detected H7N9 in this country? No. No. And there are a few other avian viruses. Do you look for H5N1? Yes, we do look for H5, yeah. yes. All right, well. but you have not seen that as well. No, okay. fortunately. Yeah. And, and the other virus on the list uh, is Ebola virus. Do you, mm. you look for that? Yes. And that would, again, be a, a travel case when there's an outbreak. Yeah. So currently there is an outbreak in DRC, right? Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. so we, we, we've had false alarms, <laughs> so-called false alarms, where suspect patients one. suspect ones, you know, coming from, you know, these countries and presenting yes. with uh, very suspect symptoms. So they go to our HLIU unit. HLI? Uh, What's that? High level isolation unit. Okay. Yes. You do you do screen for Ebola virus? Yes, right? we do. Okay. For suspect, yeah. Yeah, because we, as you know, in the U.S., we had several importations with the big mm. West African outbreak, and so you need to contain it mm. because if someone is here and it's positive, then you have to contain it. So it's important to do that. Any mm. other viruses that you look for that we haven't uh, mentioned? So the arboviruses are chick, dengue. Zika. Zika. Primarily. Primarily, yeah. right. Yeah. Oh. Um, Arbovirus, including yellow fever, West Nile. Yes, the yellow fever, West Nile. Yeah. Yellow so, fever, West Nile. What was the other? J.E. Yeah. J.E. J.E. Yeah. yeah. Do you have West Nile here? No. 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 So, so you look for it. Yes. I think EHI, uh, if I'm not wrong, or AVA, they, they do some sampling, you know, like, for example, date birds and so on. Yeah. So those one of those things. Look okay. For it. I noticed that, uh, so you were on some papers, uh, journal papers, and one you did an Epstein-Barr virus seroprevalence. Ah, oh, okay. You remember yeah. that? Yes, yes, yes. The most recent one, yeah. Well, I guess yeah. like everywhere else, most of the population is seropositive, yes. right? Yeah. But that's not a, uh, it's not a threat. It's just to know yeah. the level of uh, circulation, right? Yeah. Yeah, so th that one was done uh, on uh, pediatric residual sera, you know, yeah. so we just look at the force of infection and uh, we did find some differences between ethnic groups uh, in terms of uh, the pattern of like infection, you know. Yeah. Sure. Mm. So in a way, we are more like uh, the Western countries, but I think it's to do with uh, the fact that uh, we're very urbanized and, uh, you know, our family units are small, you know, but perhaps for other ethnic Groups, you know, sometimes they have big family units. That's right. where you have right. early infection and so on. Yeah. I also noticed that there was an outbreak of adenovirus seven in 2015. Mm. So you were on this paper. Ah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the, yeah. Exactly. And it was, so that that's the also the surveillance that the National Public Health Labs uh, helps yeah. you know, to do. Um, we do the you know further characterization of adenoviruses. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we've do, done so quite do, a bit. Do you, um, do you screen for adenoviruses in okay. respiratory patients? Yes, yeah. it's included in our respiratory virus panel. panel okay. uh, and uh, adenovirus is also, uh, we, we also have an independent assay for that. You know, um, it's, it's an issue in transplant patients, mm. immunocompromised patients as well. Yeah. Sure. Mm. So I think uh, we have, in terms of diagnostics, uh, begin to look for viruses more and more. You know, I mm -hmm. think previously, uh, you know, the testing for viruses, uh, particularly in adults, um, it's not so prevalent, but there, there are more testing being done. I think particularly with the availability of the multiplex assays, 
So, so that's quite a lot being done. Yeah. So in terms of respiratory mm. panels, we talked about influenza mm. and uh, adenoviruses. You do yeah. look for uh, para-influenza? Yes, yes. Respiratory Our, syncytial, I guess. Yes, young, RSV, definitely, yeah. Uh, what other... What other respiratory? Uh, rhinoviruses? Bo bo rhinoviruses, rhino, antro, boca virus, met metanumovirus. Okay. Yeah. Mm. So in the U.S., we've had outbreaks the, of enterovirus 68. Ah, okay, yes. Every two years. You, we, we haven't seen it. A few cases, but that are not the same genotype as U.S. US. Yeah. They have different EVs. Got it, yeah. Yeah, so we a, detected a few <coughs> cases. Yeah, but uh, it's different genotype. Yeah, yes. and not the manifestation, not the severe manifestation. Yeah, not, yeah the paralysis, yeah. acute fl mm. flaccid myelitis. Yeah, mm. but then the US one is like almost a polio-like symptoms. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Mm. But you, you, for that, you have to sequence. My understanding is because PCR doesn't differentiate yeah. between rhino and we did the sequencing and entero D sixty eight. You have to sequence it. So if you have a rhino positive, then you sequence it, and you will yes, find we it. Do it. Yeah. yeah. All the Okay. So is there anything else that I missed? So I want to, our listeners to, to learn about, you know, the, the uh, virus surveillance here in Singapore and how yeah. good it is. You have a really good healthcare system. Thank it's you. proactive and um, looking for things, you know, and not, I think the lesson learned in 99 with, uh, with NEPA is really important. They have to be yeah. proactively looking for things and yeah. you're clearly doing that. Is there anything we missed? Polio? That's uh, yeah. always a polio reference lab. It's Polio. Not, uh, yeah. Another lab. Uh, but we do have the AFP surveillance. AFP surveillance. Oh, yes. okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So polio has been eradicated from mm. this country for a but long time. Now it's re emerging uh, due to the vaccine strain that in Yeah. The va sure. vaccine derived. Yeah. Yes. So we, we are prepared for that, yeah. So yeah. vaccine-derived type 2 of polio is circulating. In fact, there have been cases in Borneo, Philippines. Philippines. So very Malaysia. close. Malaysia is the type also, 1, yeah. So the, oh, that's a type 1? Mm. So you have to keep immunization levels high. Yeah, exactly. If you do, it's not a problem. But in the Philippines, for example, it went to mm. 65%, and then yeah. that's when these circulating yeah. vaccine. But you don't do this surveillance, or you do? Yes, we do. Yeah. The uh, national surveillance. National surveillance, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, in SGH, yeah. Okay. So we have uh, AF, uh, AFP uh, cases where, uh, you know, we, the, the clinicians will have to send two samples to this yeah. laboratory where we culture it, and yeah, and hybrid. look for polio viruses. Oh, right. So you have AFP screening, right? Yes. Yeah. And then you take a fecal sample, yes. I guess, and look yeah. for polio. Yeah. Okay, so the the yeah, thing in yeah. the U.S. is that mm -hmm. it, 68 is not a fecally transmitted virus, yeah. a respiratory virus. Yes. So you would have to also look in respiratory. Yes, yes. we we do have respiratory samples, so we're able to screen that. Yeah. yeah. All right. Mm. So we've done a, a screening, one round of screening, and we have yeah. found 68. Yeah. Yeah. The other one we have is a measles rubella. Yeah, I mentioned measles that. Yeah. Is a mm. moral and a rota. Mm. Norovirus and notavirus, we are monitoring the genotyping as well. Mm. Ah, so that's part of your... Uh, the salmonella, food, food, food pathogens, you know, right. diarrhea but, uh, pathogens. But the measles and mumps and rubella, the norovirus, mm. uh, rotavirus also, you said? Mm. You do surveillance for that. So if you have mm. GI cases, GI illness, that would be part yeah. of that. Yeah, exactly. So as I said, we are also part of the uh, investigation of outbreaks. And a lot of these outbreaks are foodborne outbreaks. Right. Mm. All right. Well, thank you so much. My guest today has been Dr. Nancy Teep, National Public Health Laboratory. Thank you so much for yeah. speaking with me. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you very much for the invitation. <laughs> yeah. We are back at the National Center for Infectious Diseases in Singapore this morning. We were at the National Public Health Laboratory, which is part of this. And now it's my honor to speak with the Executive Director, Yishin Liu. Welcome to TWIV. Good afternoon. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. I'm here because of the Nipah virus meeting. I saw you at it the other day. That's right. Yes. And so I'm taking the advantage while I'm here to speak with uh, some people about infectious diseases. So I wonder if we could start with talking a little bit about uh, NCID. What, when was it founded? A, the official opening just a few months ago hmm. in the month of September so we are relatively new in a sense. This is a very new building. 
we moved in about a year ago and uh, this place was officially opened in September this year. Mm. And the, uh, the laboratory, the National Public Health Laboratory is part of NCID, correct? Yeah, it is part of uh, NCID. In fact, NCID is a relatively unique structure, I should say, where we put the clinical services, in other words, patient care, together with public health, that mm. the MPHL is, is part of it, as well as training, education and research, all under one uh, organization. Mm -hmm. I asked a few people if, it were, if NCID were like CDC, and they said it's different because we have patients. That's right, yeah. So we are kind of like putting together clinical services, patients, together with public health part, which is the CDC components, and hopefully do the research like what NIH provides to the U.S. system. Right, right, exactly. So what, what is your role as director of the uh, NCID? Uh, essentially, almost like everything. <laughs> 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 because I'm a clinician, so um, I do have uh, my own patient load. Mm. Uh, in addition to that, I basically spend most of my time uh, currently doing administrative work, taking care of the entire setup. And because it's a very new establishment, so there's a lot of uh, components that we need to put together and be able to drive towards uh, what we hope to have a very streamlined, integrated approach. So tell me a little bit about your training. You're from China originally? So no, I'm, I'm Singaporean. You're I'm, Singaporean. I'm local born, um, local trained infectious disease clinician. You went to medical school here. I went to medical school in Singapore, and uh, I followed the uh, local training system, uh, whereby after my uh, internal medicine training, mm -hmm. I took up infectious disease as my specialty training. And of the infectious disease, I then took up HIV medicine mm. as my subspecialty uh, subject. And I went through a very challenging period where there was hardly any ART to very few ART mm. to where we are today where we have multiple choices, good treatment uh, and good outcome. Mm. So you chose to move into clinical research as opposed to purely clinical practice. Why was that? Well, I spent almost 10 years um, managing the HIV program mm. where I managed to put together a very comprehensive program in the year 1995. So effectively, very little medications at mm -hmm. a point in time, and we need to take care of our patients till basically their last breath. So it was very, very challenging uh, at that point. Uh, what changed my course in terms of my contribution mm -hmm. to the public health system was in actual fact, Nipah outbreak. Yeah. Yeah. So in 1999, I was called upon to manage the Nipah outbreak, providing clinical treatment and uh, clinical care uh, in the uh, Communicable Disease Centre, which is the predecessor of uh, NCID. So we received all the Nipah cases to CDC except the very first case. Mm -hmm. The very first case was admitted to a different hospital in another general hospital and subsequently, the second case came to Tan Tok Seng Hospital. The third case went to another general hospital. So I think this is a very common phenomenon when you look at outbreak, where same conditions can be emitted to different hospital, mm -hmm. and we don't have a surveillance system, we'll be in trouble because we cannot make the link of potentially three cases yeah. uh, at a very short period of time. Um, so um, when CDC was activated, I was asked to manage the entire outbreak. I see. So these these th first three patients that went to three different hospitals, were, were they finally connected at some point? Yeah, they were <laughs> finally connected at uh, some point because of the epidemiological link yeah. and also because of the peculiar characteristic. So what happened was that the first case was admitted to one general hospital and mm -hmm. he was very, very sick. He presented with uh, CNS and uh, pulmonary manifestations, went into coma soon after he was admitted to the hospital. His brother was admitted to another general hospital. Mm -hmm. So when they managed to match the history together, we then realized that, in fact, it is epidemiological link. Mm. Once the ministry realized that it was uh, epidemiological link, they then activate my center. 
And from that point onwards, we drain in all the cases. Mm -hmm. We took care of the contact tracing, examinations, um, and basically that was it. So this was after the outbreak in Malaysia, right? Yes. Or at the same time? It was in the middle, I should say, or rather at the tail end of the Malaysia Nipah uh, outbreak. Mm -hmm. um, from the conference, we, we understand that uh, it was at least two to three months of the very uncertain period mm. in Malaysia, trying to figure out the etiologic agent. By the time it came to Singapore, we kind of received some information mm -hmm. from our counterpart in Malaysia. And the information provided to me at the time when we first arrived, um, it was some kind of Hendra-like virus. So that was the point uh, when mm. Singapore was involved. Okay. And this, so originally in Malaysia, it was an outbreak on a pig farm, which involved pigs and pig handlers, right? That's so right. it came to Singapore through pig, to pig yes. traffic, right? right? And if I understand, you don't have pig farms here, but you we import. import them and they're yeah. slaughtered in abattoirs, right? Mm. And that's where the... That's right, yes. And the pigs, you can't tell they're sick, right? Yes, <laughs> yes. In fact, they're all very healthy because yeah. when we imported them, we, we kind of like, I believe, uh, bring in the healthy animal. Uh, the system in place in Singapore was that we import the live uh, animal mm. and the live animal will have to go through an exhibition process. And that exhibition process will allow the pig beater to beat for the, the pig mm -hmm. for consumption. And then we have, of course, the abattoir workers to usher the pig through this exhibition channel. And uh, in fact, the, the, the abattoir workers, what we call them pig chaser. <laughs> in other words, the chase behind yeah. uh, the pig, uh, the one that with the greatest exposure to the pig's excreta, urine as well as a stool. Uh, and they were the one with the highest risk of Nipah infection. Ah. So I'm curious, at what point did you make the connection with the, the uh, outbreak in Malaysia? Um, I, I believe it um, didn't take us too long mm. uh, when the first case and subsequently second case, third case, um, and there was communications going on between different ministries. In fact, the ministries involved in Singapore were the Ministry of Health, mm -hmm. taking care of the human, as well as the Ministry of Environment uh, that... Uh, that, that interact with the uh, agricultural uh, component. Okay. And so how many cases ended up in Singapore? Uh, in total, we had 11 cases. Mm -hmm. And uh, we subsequently identified a few more. And I think it's roughly in the range about 11 or 13, I can't remember precisely, of asymptomatic infection. Mm. And the way we identified asymptomatic infections uh, was that... Um, we managed to work with CDC Atlanta uh, to be able to run the serology mm -hmm. uh, of uh, many different groups yeah. uh, of individuals. So we screened almost all the epitoire workers. We also screened all the healthcare workers who came into contact with the cases, family members, uh, as well as uh, zoo handlers and uh, butchers and, and, and different groups uh, of people. Uh, in the end, we identified uh, about 10 to 11 to 13 cases of the apertoire workers only with a positive serology reaction. And I still can recall that I did MRI for some of them, clinically completely asymptomatic, but MRI showed these hyperdense lesions. It was unfortunate that I couldn't do longitudinal mm. tracking of these individuals. Because most of the abattoir workers at that point in time, they were in the age of 50s, 60s, and most of them are actually uh, foreign workers. Mm. They came from Malaysia. So after the incidents, many of them left, went back home, and uh, kind of like lost contact. And the most important thing is that I couldn't secure fun. Mm. It was not enough <laughs> fun for me to carry on my work. Yeah. You didn't check the families for serial conversion, right? We did. And did any of them seroconvert? No. no. So we, we couldn't find any human-to-human uh, yeah. -human transmission. So how was that outbreak in Singapore stopped, or did it just stop on its own? It stopped on itself, but the minutes we 
terminated the importations. Okay. Once we banned the importations of livestock, we basically stopped the uh, transmission. Right. So this meeting, the NEPA meeting, I found remarkable, the progress that's been made. And since you've seen it from the beginning, what, what do you think about it? Well, I mean, to most of us, because we have many different other outbreaks that came along mm. our way, um, NIPA, I must say that to many people, many of the healthcare workers in Singapore is a uh, long forgotten things. Uh -huh. They've forgotten the episodes of uh, many of them. Yeah. Well, we have now looks like promising vaccines and candidates anyway, therapeutics, diagnostics being developed. It's really remarkable, I think. So since the 99 outbreak here, there have been no more cases of no NIPA. more cases of NIPA. Do you Singapore. screen? Do you screen at all for for NIPA? If we do suspect, we would. Uh, but uh, I do believe that uh, that uh, we have not seen any case. So you would have a patient with encephalitis, right? And you would you would screen for NIPA. But you would probably also screen for Japanese encephalitis virus, right? We will have to make a very special request yeah. if we do suspect that this could be a viral encephalitis of unknown origins or with animal uh, encounter animals, uh, yeah. and perhaps we will make a very specific request to run for NIPA PCR. Now we do uh, Japanese encephalitis uh, tests, uh, but I think because of the viremia period, it's actually very, very short, as well as the CSF uh, mm. as well. So it's not easy to get the PCR positive uh, uh, sample. Right. Uh, we do the IgM, IgG, and occasionally we do pick up uh, cases with IgM uh, positive. Mm. Interesting. So recent infection. With recent infection. Yeah, interesting. So, of course, after that, now we have outbreaks in Bangladesh and India, where in Bangladesh, the date palm sap is, yes. is implicated. Mm. We don't know what's going on in India yet. Mm. So that's why we have all this development in the field in this meeting, which I found was really interesting. So let's talk about some other outbreaks you've mm. participated in. Um, SARS, 2003. What do you remember about that? Yes, yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> it's a major chapter in my life. <laughs> and what's your first recollection? What do you remember? Well, uh, it was a surprise call to me um, for the fact that uh, I was preparing to go for holiday. It was March. Eh? March is the uh, Singapore school holiday period where, you know, most of the parents will bring their kids uh, for holiday. Uh, and, and it was the March period, the school holiday period, uh, and it was Friday. Mm -hmm. uh, I was all ready <laughs> to go for my <laughs> vacations uh, with, my, with my family. And then um, I remembered my hospital uh, administrator uh, called for urgent meeting, and it was Friday afternoon. And then he decided that uh, he will not approve any leave. Everybody must stay behind because Singapore, we have identified an unusual situations and very likely link back to the SARS incidents in, in Hong Kong. Mm. And then he then added on to say that, no, only I want you to stay back. I also want you to lead the entire operation at, uh, at CDC at that time. Uh, so then gone my, my holidays and <laughs> I had to stay back to work. But I must say that um, the NIPA episodes for me has taught me a lot of very, very good practical lessons on the ground. And many of these lessons learned, in fact, were applied uh, during SARS. I'll just give you some example. Um, when we first encountered NIPA, we had no um, system in place to have good infection control practices, to be able to streamline our practices, uh, have capability to capture information as quickly as possible. Um, so when, when, when I was called upon to, to, um, to manage SARS in Communicable Disease Center. So we decided that we must have a system in place as quickly as possible. And sad to say again, it was a uh, Friday, <laughs> Friday afternoon. So over the entire weekend, we managed to streamline our workflow and we put up a draft sessions. And that sections were effectively screened through some of the key epidemiological uh, factors, as well as clinical symptoms. Those individuals who fulfill the epidemiological contact link 
as well as exhibiting symptoms. Uh, we consider them as high risk. For the high risk individuals, we will then streamline them into isolation facilities straight away. And for those individuals that, that did not fulfill any of all these criteria, we assess them at a separate location. Mm. So straight away, we streamline this flow to minimize cross-contamination. And we also realize from a Nipah outbreak that we need to have one-stop management, meaning that you know we will see the patients, we will take the blood, we will do the radiological examinations, we will determine the course of action subsequently into one piece flow. And we did that during SARS. Mm. And it was successful in the sense that we are able to minimize all these uh, infectious conditions being leaked into uh, internally into the healthcare system. Mm. Mm. Um, and then the other things we learned was that uh, healthcare management, healthcare workers management, um, that we soon um, figure out that there is quite a fair bit of intra-hospital transmission from first, second, third generations of the, the NIPA, uh, uh, the SARS transmissions. So immediately we set up these systems of what we call fever surveillance system. Mm. So all the healthcare workers will need to take their own body temperature, report the findings into a system. And uh, for those healthcare workers who discovered that they may be running a temperature, we will remove them from the workforce as quickly as possible isolate them, assess them uh, mm. before we allow them to have uh, further course of actions. So I, 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 I think I am very fortunate to have gone through Nipah outbreak mm. and use that um, lesson learned to apply uh, during the SARS outbreak. Were there any temperature screens put in the airport like they did in China? Uh, it was much later. Mm. Um, from the 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 initial wave of the clinical cases, uh, because this is always an argument in terms of how you uh, put together a case definition. Mm -hmm. If the case definitions include fever, plus other clinical symptoms, and all your cases will have fever. Uh, but indeed, all our cases had fever. So we use fever as an indicator mm -hmm. uh, to do the screening. And because we were successful in the clinical setting, in using fever as a screening indicator, uh, we have another engineering group mm -hmm. decided to put up a, a thermal scanner. So they develop a thermal scanner during the, the SARS period mm -hmm. and then apply them uh, over different locations uh, to capture this uh, temperature. I see. Yeah. So that, that first Friday when you had to miss your vacation, what was, what was the reason they had identified some unusual uh, cases yeah. in Singapore? Yeah, in, in actual fact, it was all very interesting in terms of the past. Uh, what had happened during the time was that we had a group of international experts mm -hmm. in Singapore to spend five days with us to look into the development of a new infectious disease hospital. And at that time, not National Centre for Infectious Disease, uh, but we reckon that uh, after Nipah, we need to have a dedicated uh, hospital to replace the old facilities, the Communicable Disease Centre. So we had a group of uh, internal international experts to look into our concept plan and also the uh, blueprint uh, mm -hmm. of the new hospital. I, I still remember on the last day of the meeting, we had to call it quick because we are now facing with an unusual uh, conditions, unusual situations, the, the SARS situations. Uh, and I must say that it is a blessing in disguise because when we look back in terms of the concept mm -hmm. and design of the new infectious disease hospital, it will never be able to even handle SARS. Mm -hmm. wow. So we were very fortunate in yeah, a sense that right. on that Friday, uh, the last day of the meeting, we quite quit. So, do you, were you able to trace how uh, the infection uh, entered? Yes, uh, yes. Um, again, very interesting story. Um, it was during the period where there were a lot of uh, there were a lot of uh, uh, incidents happen happening around the same time in in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. I still remember it was February when uh, Hong Kong diagnosed the avian influenza mm -hmm. of the father and son who came back from Fujian. 
Right, right. And then in, in March, we had our first index patients admitted to Tan Tok Seng Hospital. Mm -hmm. And we thought that uh, she could have uh, had the avian influenza. So we were really chasing along that line mm. that uh, she could be exposed and gotten the avian influenza. But all the tests that we ran were all turned out negative. <laughs> no bacteria, no viruses that uh, we could identify. She was kept in the general ward uh, with shared facilities for about uh, a week or so mm. until she turned ill that we had to transfer her from the open wards to ICU, intensive care unit. And we were fortunate that in the intensive care unit is single isolated facilities. Mm -hmm. The entire ICU units uh, was built uh, in that way. So we were fortunate that uh, mm. she's been isolated. And then we realized that, um, that um, soon we had a few reports of healthcare workers became ill and the index patient's parents mm. became ill and the visitors visited her in the hospital. Some of them became ill, mm. including her pastor. Mm. So when we <laughs> gotten all these information, and that was the reason why on the Friday afternoon, we called for an emergency meeting and I had to cancel my leave. I see. So was she a super spreader, do you think? Yes. She was. Yeah. She turned out to be a super spreader. In yeah. fact, she created, I think, the first loom of the the outbreak involving at least 20 to 30 individuals. So what was the total number of cases in Singapore? Uh, 238 cases. I see. Right. And how did you stop the outbreak? Oh, okay. It's a, it's a long story. <laughs> it took us about uh, two to three months to reach to the final destination. 31st May was the day we declared uh, SARS free uh, of Singapore. Mm -hmm. And the first case that, uh, that uh, came into the hospital, I think it was around six March. So it took us that long uh, to finally stem out the, uh, mm -hmm. the transmissions mm -hmm. of SARS in the hospital. And there are many twists and turns because the entire episodes evolve very quickly, involving um, the entire public health care uh, institutions. Yeah. So not only Tan Tok Seng Hospital, there are other general hospitals affected as well. So uh, in the end, it was good infection control that stopped it. And you, I, you also identified the virus in these patients as well, right? Uh, we did. Uh, I worked very closely with uh, our virologist mm -hmm. uh, who was stationed in uh, Singapore General Hospital and the only lab at that point in time, uh, they would do the viral isolation mm -hmm. as well as uh, the electron microscopy examination. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we, we went through a period where, you know, uncertain of the etiology with a lot of information coming in from Hong Kong, talking about different kind of uh, etiological agent. Uh, but my virologist did the EM and found a crown-like uh, virus. Mm. <laughs> so I think uh, from that point onwards, plus the other sites, yeah. uh, having studied the situation as well, and we just match uh, very nicely. Right. Yeah, that is a coronavirus. So as you know, there are similar viruses circulating in bats in China, yes. right? So does it... Do you worry about it again occurring? Oh, this this why we have a national center for infectious <laughs> That's diseases. That's right. <laughs> yes. So if someone had atypical respiratory disease, you would mm -hmm. you would request a, a diagnosis of, or a a lab test for SARS virus, right? Yes. Currently, we have uh, put in place specifically in terms of uh, some of the uh, known respiratory conditions like uh, MERS coronavirus. Yeah. So for for travelers who came from the uh, affected area right. uh, coming into Singapore uh, with fever, with respiratory symptoms. In general, we will isolate them, have the sample uh, tested uh, to make sure that uh, we, we, we are not uh, encountering a sure. case of another coronavirus. Yeah, that MERS would be the more mm. likely because it's currently infecting mm. people. Right? And, and also because of the human traffic, we do have quite a sizable number of uh, travelers and also a Muslim populations going yeah. to the Middle East. Yeah, but there, um, since since many people acquire it there from camels, that it's not going to happen here because you don't have camels, right? In a zoo, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> In the zoo camels. Yeah. But um, I think well, the, zoo, the zoo workers could get it. But uh, MERS, with good infection control, you can easily stop 
change, as long as you're aware of it. So yes. in Korea, that was the problem. They weren't aware of it, and it got out of control. Well, I, I hope, uh, first of all, we can identify the first case. Yeah. Exactly. And we also hope that the first case don't turn out as a super spread. Sure. So there, you, you mentioned avian influenza. So there are periodically some avian influenza viruses uh, that cause little outbreaks in China, H7N9, for mm -hmm. example. So do you also keep uh, aware of those and look for those in the right people? Yeah, right. right. Um, you also had, so the couple of other viruses I wanted to talk with you about, you had a chikungunya outbreak here. Yes. You remember that? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> 2008. Um, mm. How did that present? Did it look like dengue? Um, well, um, basically, <clears throat> I'm, I'm involved in all the outbreaks <laughs> sure. in Singapore, <clears throat> including the chikungunya uh, outbreak. Um, so it happens to be one of the astute general practitioners mm -hmm. uh, who practice in the communities catering a lot of her services to our foreign workers from India. So she is uh, uh, of Indian ethnicity and uh, when she uh, noticed that uh, there was an increased number of uh, foreign workers coming in with fever, joy pain, symptoms and yet it's dengue negative so she decided to send mm. the specimens to um, the environmental health institute uh, one of the uh, operational and research institute in singapore that uh, it, that is also who's arbovirus uh, center and and there bingo you know they managed to get the diagnosis right that mm -hmm. it was chikungunya um, and that was in around january uh, when when the first uh, chikungunya incidents happened in Singapore, uh, and it was interesting in the in the sense that uh, the ministry decided that because of our past experience of containment with uh, SARS, we decided to also contain the chikungunya uh, outbreak uh, in Singapore. So what we did then was uh, to start massive screening uh, of people. Uh, using the index case locations mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. draw a circle about 150 meters wide and went into the entire areas to round up people uh, around there uh, and have questionnaire and mm. have their blood taken uh, for testing. And with that, we detected about 11 cases mm. in total. Uh, and it, it, it was amazingly, you know, we managed to stem the entire transmissions. So that was the one episode, one peak of uh, chikungunya mm. uh, in Singapore. Uh, but unfortunately, because uh, chikungunya has been spreading around uh, the region, uh, and it came back to Singapore, and we had another big outbreak mm. uh, in the month of August uh, in 2008. And when we look back, when we analyze the evolutions of the entire chikungunya outbreak, then we realized that, in fact, there was this wild strain and uh, and the mutated uh, strain of V226. So the first outbreak was caused by the wild type, and uh, it is then it was then transmitted by Aedes aegypti mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. it's, it's densely populated in the Indian community in the center of Singapore, uh, and it wasn't a very uh, well suited vector, and therefore we could fortunately able to stem the entire transmissions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But by the time she came back to Singapore in August, it was the mutated one uh, mm -hmm. and uh, with a very effective uh, vector of uh, apopictus. And then we realized that we could not uh, achieve what we had done uh, in, in the past. And we decided that, you know, uh, vector control will be the key principles mm -hmm. in terms of the, the, the public health response uh, and accepted that the jigagunia would and be able to come back and possibly on and off. I won't say endemic because for a long period of time, we have not detected chikungunya cases mm. until recently. Okay, so any future cases will likely be imported. It is likely to be imported. Yeah. Yes, okay. all right. I heard wonderful um, examples of how the uh, Environmental Health Institute is experimenting with mosquito Ubaqia. control. That's right. Mm. Fascinating, this is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> we visited the mosquito production facility, and mm. that, that that's really remarkable. 
I think that's great. Uh, but of course, that's 80s Egypti, so uh, it's not Elbow Pictus. Um, one thing I've talked about with uh, several people is today is uh, influenza. That's another mm. infectious disease. Do you worry about that? Oh, yes. I think uh, uh, pandemic is, is always uh, something on our mind. Yeah. So in 2009, do you remember the, <laughs> yes, yes, of course, yes. you, do. you remember the H1N1 right. pandemic, right? Yes. Um, and, and of course, a new one is going to arise at some point. Mm. So that's one you, you do very careful surveillance for, right? Yes. You look right. at what strains. Mm. And I saw somewhere on my journey here a sign saying, get the second flu vaccine. Oh, yes. Because <laughs> there are two you can get, right? Right. Um, the, the reason why um, this year is a little bit special is because the northern strains, there is uh, H1 and H3 that is right. different from the southern strain. So it might be necessary to have both, right? Uh, we don't know, but uh, <laughs> yeah, it's something that I think we have to leave to learn. Right. The other, the other interesting story uh, which I've read about is this monkeypox mm. importation, yes. and you were involved in that, right? Yes. Of course, you're involved in all infectious <laughs> viral infectious disease. So, what do you remember about that? Oh, it was very interesting. Uh, that was a, a case where NCID already in operation. Uh, so mm -hmm. all of us already moved in into these uh, facilities, including National Public Health Laboratory, the clinical service, the clinics. Um, and uh, we were at a heightened alert most of the time uh, about potential importations of unusual uh, organisms. And monkeypox was on one of the items that we are looking at basically because of Nigeria uh, reported monkeypox mm. outbreak. So it is an item that we have heard of and we are keeping an eye on. So when we had the patients uh, admitted to the emergency department of mm -hmm. Pantok Singh Hospital uh, with his country of origin, with his uh, background of history, uh, we soon suspected that this can be a very unusual uh, conditions and uh, the possibility of monkeypox was thrown out at a point in time in consultations with one of my ID colleagues. Mm -hmm. And because of that, we decided that from that point onwards, we need to isolate him mm -hmm. and, uh, and, uh, and examine him. So he was isolated all the way from the point of uh, uh, introductions to this place, all the way to the negative pressure isolation room in NCID. Um, I, I would say that uh, thankfully the entire team uh, was fully aware uh, and also because of this uh, one-stop principle uh, over one arching uh, organizations, we are able to streamline clinical care and laboratory and public health uh, in, in, a, in, in a simple flow manner. Where the patients came in around 8 o'clock into the negative pressure isolation room, reviewed by my senior staff, called the National Public Health Laboratory early in the morning, mm. sent the specimen <laughs> over to them on the same day uh, at around 7, 8 p.m. Uh, we were confident uh, at that point to call it uh, monkeypox with the sequencing data and also with the EM uh, mm. picture. Yeah, they showed us the picture. That's right, yeah. Beautiful. Mm. <laughs> no and of course, uh, there was no treatment necessary, right? No, we, we didn't venture into treatment uh, for the fact that uh, he was clinically relatively stable. Mm. Now, I, I suspect that he knew about these conditions. I mean, he's, he's, a, he's a highly educated individual. He came to Singapore for a workshop. Mm. Uh, I believe he had heard of monkeypox from his country of origin. And when he became symptomatic, he decided to isolate himself. Mm. So he isolated himself in the hotel room mm -hmm. until his friend felt that uh, they could not uh, leave him alone. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, they called for ambulance to send him to the hospital. And that's how right. he ended up in our place. Of course, he might not have. So another person might not have even done that, and they would have just recovered right. anyway, and yeah. you would never know. So he probably got it from a rodent source in Nigeria, right? We believe so. Um, apparently, he went to a uh, family uh, relative's wedding and uh, was served different kind of uh, meat and things like that. Mm. Uh, he, he worked in the city area, but he traveled to yeah. the village yeah, yeah. to attend the, uh, the wedding. As you know, since we've stopped 
smallpox vaccination. We're seeing more and more of these different kind of cases. Pox, yeah. Yeah. I mean, right. they're called monkeypox, but actually the, they're, they're, yeah. they're, they're in mice and rodents, right? right. Yeah, that's yeah. very interesting. So you said earlier that you still see infectious disease patients of all sorts, viruses, bacteria, mm -hmm. all sorts of infections. So you enjoy doing that? Well, I always enjoy being a clinician. Mm -hmm. It's just that uh, I have uh, less time now yes. uh, in seeing patients. Uh, I, I still hold a HIV management clinic. Mm -hmm. So um, do you ever think of what you would have done if you hadn't been a doctor? <laughs> yes, I think I would be a very successful businesswoman. <laughs> really? <laughs> very good. My guest uh, today has been the executive director of the National Center for Infectious Diseases, Yishin Leo. Thank you so much for joining me. You can find TWIV at microbe.tv and on any podcast player. If you have questions or comments, send them to TWIV at microbe.tv. And if you like what we do, consider supporting us, microbe.tv slash contribute. My guests for this episode recorded in Singapore, Dr. Nancy T. from the National Public Health Laboratory and Dr. Leo Yi Sin, the Executive Director of the National Center for Infectious Diseases. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you can find me at virology.blog. I'd like to thank ASV, the American Society for Virology, and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIV was recorded, edited, and posted by me, Vincent Racaniello. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>